Okay, we're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, we're figuring that out. <laughs> uh, let's uh, look again at the tapestry. And so we have uh, we have come a long way. So let's just quickly review that. Uh, we saw that God created a kingdom in which uh, he had a uh, theocratic administrator, a paraffin, and uh, they uh, were responsible for managing what God had given. And uh, then, of course, we know that they failed in that. And uh, as a result of that, the kingdom uh, was ceded, at least for a time, to Satan. And uh, the, we had the announcement uh, that would uh, tell us that God was going to do two things uh, as a minimum. There's lots that he's doing. Uh, but one is that he would provide salvation uh, and deliverance from the sin that had entered the world. Uh, but it was also an announcement that he would retake the kingdom. And so that's where we started out. And then we had uh, the uh, judgments of God. Uh, we had judgment at the flood. And uh, we've seen how God has moved things along. And uh, as we have moved through the scriptures, uh, we got eventually to the covenants the covenant of the Abrahamic covenant and also the Mosaic covenant uh, with uh, that are the basis of everything else that we're going to see in the scriptures. And then <coughs> after those were given, of course, the nation of Israel expanded in uh, look at the simple stuff here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the uh, nation of Israel expanded and uh, grew, and uh, of course, as it went along, after uh, the law was given, uh, then Moses became what we call the, another theocratic administrator who was administering uh, God's uh, authority in the nation. It's not a return to the kingdom, but it was, if you like, a small subset that God put in place, and uh, as it moved on from Moses, and, and, and as things progressed, and we see, as we go along, we see judges, and we see kings, and of course, at every point, uh, they failed, uh, so the nation failed under Moses, and uh, they spent 40 years in the wilderness, until the unbelieving generation died, and uh, as well as that, uh, failed under Joshua, uh, because they never fully secured the land of promise, even though there was a certain amount of success in their uh, campaigns. And then uh, the nation also underwent cycles of failure under the judges. As you go through that, you see this cycle over and over again of uh, being restored uh, under a judge, and then failure, etc., and then back into the cycle again. And then uh, they started with a king, and of course they failed under Saul. And then we had David, who was after the heart of the Lord. And so as a nation, there was some success uh, as a nation. And then Solomon, of course, followed. And they had a period of relative peace. Uh, and, but yet they never uh, took possession of the whole land. Uh, never took possession of all of the promises of God in uh, the Abrahamic covenant. And they feel continually uh, with regard to the Mosaic covenant, the law. And uh, we do that as well. And so that brought us uh, this morning to the times when the nation was uh, judged by the Lord and Assyria uh, took the northern nation and uh, Nebuchadnezzar 
to the southern nation into Babylon. And so we have this period now that has begun uh, under, uh, from the time of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the time of the times of the Gentiles. And so we're still in the fifth dispensation. And I moved that and I didn't even realize that was up. <laughs> so anyway, we get into the book of Daniel and we find that Daniel is given a number of prophecies uh, as you go through the book of Daniel. And uh, this particular prophecy uh, will take us into New Testament times. And uh, we find around it uh, various uh, prophecies with regard to kingdoms and also the kingdom. So we'll start here with Daniel 9 for a few moments. We're not going to dwell on this because I'm sure many of you have uh, seen the calculations with regard to the weeks of years. Uh, but just to notice uh, that uh, this is very Jewish. It says uh, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. So that's speaking to Daniel, who were Daniel's people. Well, it was the nation Israel. And upon thy holy city. So it's Jerusalem to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity and bring in everlasting righteousness and seal up the vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy. And then we get into this uh, prophecy of weeks. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. What were the seven weeks for? Were the build the city? Absolutely, that was when uh, they finished off building, uh, rebuilding Jerusalem, and so that was uh, seven sevens, which is forty nine, so forty nine years, and then uh, the next three score and two weeks are added to that, and that brings us right up to Messiah coming into Jerusalem, and if we are to go with the the calculations of Sir Robert Anderson, uh, that would take it to the very day that the Lord rode into Jerusalem on the donkey and uh, was hailed uh, by the people. And yet a couple of days later, uh, they want to crucify him. And so uh, we see the calculation of this in just a few moments. Uh, After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. In other words, he's our substitute and he was dying for us. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And so uh, we're looking at the prophecy with regard to the end of Jerusalem uh, or the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. But then in verse 27, it switches to the Antichrist. And it says, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. So that's seven years. And in the midst of the week, he'll cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So we have this, uh, uh, this prophecy that is given to Daniel, And, of course, you'll remember that Daniel uh, was one of the first group that went to Babylon. There were three waves of uh, conquest as Nebuchadnezzar took three groups, three different uh, times, and took them to Babylon. And Daniel was one of the noble families, and uh, he was one of the first that was taken to Babylon. And, of course, we know his history that he became Uh, basically prime minister more or less and had significant influence in Babylon and we know also that it's because he was reading the prophet Jeremiah that he began to understand that the people would not be in captivity forever that they would be brought back or allowed to uh, return to the land not worry about that one 
And here's our 490 years, the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. It's very interesting that uh, at this particular point, we start to get very definite dates. And so uh, the, uh, the weeks of years are dated from the day on which the commandment was given to restore and build the walls of Jerusalem to Nehemiah. Uh, from the king, and that uh, figure was the 1st of Nisan, or the 14th of March, 445 BC. And so we add on our seven weeks of years for the completion of the building of Jerusalem, and then on top of that we add on the 62 weeks, uh, which uh, is 434 years, and that gives us 483 years from the moment the command went out to restore and build Jerusalem right until the Messiah, the king, uh, came into Jerusalem. And uh, it is figured, in at least in Anderson's uh, calculations, which I believe are correct, although uh, we were having a discussion earlier with Dennis, and we were both aware of uh, a Dallas professor uh, by the name of Honer, Mr. Honer, and uh, he has produced a book that makes everything a year different to what Anderson had. But anyway, uh, this is what happened. The Lord arrived in Jerusalem, and uh, if we go by Anderson's dating, uh, that would have been the 6th of April in 32 AD, or the 10th of Nisan, which is the Jewish reckoning. So the years prophesied were 490 years. The years completed when the Lord Jesus came into Jerusalem were 483 years, and there is absolutely no record anywhere, uh, either biblical or extra-biblical or anywhere else, of those final seven years having either come or been completed. And so, obviously, there's still future, and we know what uh, we'll discuss a little later about those seven years. And so God is moving things forward, and uh, it's interesting uh, to mention because uh, now uh, Judah is going to be given permission, uh, to, and uh, as you uh, follow that through the book of Ezra, uh, we find uh, two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, and when you read the books of Haggai and Zechariah, this again is where you get very definite dates. The whole of those two books are dated exactly. And it'll tell you at this time, this happened, at this time, this happened, etc. And so again, we can figure out what's going on at the time. And God is giving us these waypoints as he again lays out part of this tapestry as he's moving towards uh, both uh, the Son of God coming and dying and rising again to provide salvation, but also in that process where he will become the one to bring in the kingdom. And so uh, we, as we go through, uh, we obviously know the uh, times of the Gentiles. It started with Nebuchadnezzar, uh, but it also has to do with these uh, governments uh, with these nations uh, who are uh, going to uh, have a, an effect on the nation Israel. And of course at the time uh, when they were going into uh, captivity, uh, we have the departure of the glory of the Lord from the temple in Ezekiel. And of course Ezekiel was there captive in Babylon too. And so all of these converge, all these prophecies, Daniel, Ezekiel, we get uh, uh, Zechariah, we get uh, Haggai, etc., and others, and they are all converging at this time as the Lord is bringing this particular uh, phase of world history uh, to a conclusion so that uh, in the fullness of time, he will send his son. And uh, so we have the timing of it, uh, from the 490 years and the 483 with the seven left over. And then we find if we have a look in Hosea, uh, we have a prophecy with regard uh, to the fact that uh, 
there will be no king on the throne of Israel. And so in Hosea chapter 3 and verse 3, it, and uh, of course Hosea has to do with Hosea and Gomer, so it's all in the, in the context of uh, that life uh, that the Lord asked Hosea to lead uh, with regard to Gomer. And in verse 3 it says, I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me many days, and thou shalt not play the harlot, and thou shalt not be for another man, so will I also be for thee. And then in verse 4, For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, and without an image, without an ephod, without teraphim. And afterward shall the children of Israel return, and seek the Lord their God, and David their king, and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. And so here we have this prophecy, again, that's indicating that from this time, uh, because you'll remember uh, that Warren talked about the last king, uh, Zedekiah, and uh, he, uh, as, as they went along, there was the curse, and so the line from which Messiah would come jumped from Solomon's line to Nathan's line. And so even though it has jumped, there is still not going to be a king on the throne. The line will continue, but there will be no king reigning on a throne for Israel. And so as it goes through, it goes through the times of the Gentiles, and the whole of the times of the Gentiles, there is no king or prince in Israel. And so we can't expect to see a king or a prince, uh, for instance, popping up in Israel in our day. Uh, but certainly, uh, when the Lord returns, then they will have their king and a prince also, which we'll mention that later, perhaps. And so we have this term, the times of the Gentiles, and the times of the Gentiles refer to those times when basically Israel is under if you like, the boot of the Gentile nations. And of course, uh, after the time of the Lord Jesus and when Israel uh, was sacked by uh, General Titus from Rome in 70 AD, and then further, uh, there was further deportations of Jews in, I think it was the 130s. And so at that time, the Jews were spread across the world and did not have a country. And of course, we know that that continued until 1948, uh, when again, uh, a country was established. And of course, that is a significant uh, event in the na nation's history, uh, because that event indicates that God is once again starting to work with the nation Israel. Not with individual Jews, They're, they've always had salvation uh, available to them. Uh, individually, but as a nation. And so uh, in uh, Luke chapter 21, uh, we get this term, the times of the Gentiles. And as you go there in verse 24, you will see that it's the Lord Jesus himself who uses that term. Uh, in verse 24, it says, they shall fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So in that, and not only does the Lord uh, tell us that there's a period that he names the times of the Gentiles, but he's also telling us that that time will have an end. It does not go on uh, indefinitely, but... Uh, it will go on and something will bring it to an end, uh, which we will see is actually the return of the Lord to the earth himself. And so uh, in uh, Revelation 11 and verse 2, this is... Uh, uh, one of the times out in the book of the Revelation, uh, the uh, chronology as it moves through, uh, time stops for a moment to give us a whole bunch more information on some things. 
And so uh, in verse 1 it says, There was given to me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty-two months. And so here is a, uh, as we're moving towards the end, we're in the tribulation, and as we're moving towards the end of the tribulation, uh, we find that the Gentiles will be able to tread underfoot the temple. Now what temple? Well, there is no temple there, but uh, most of you are somewhat watchers of pro prophetic things, and you're probably aware that there's all sorts of moves uh, for the Jews to rebuild their third temple. They're very actively talking about it. They're very actively planning for it. They're very actively providing the things that would be necessary if the temple was built. Uh, there's been lots of emphasis over the past couple of years on the red heifer uh, that would be necessary to dedicate the temple, etc. And so, <clears throat> uh, under uh, we will see that they sign a peace treaty with the Antichrist at the beginning of the seven years. And so, there's a relative peace for them, even though the world is, is kind of like a ravening dog. Uh, they're preparing to come and deal with Israel. They want to get rid of Israel, but they have some uh, protection under Antichrist for the first half of those years. And then, of course, he breaks the treaty that we read about in Daniel. And uh, from that moment on, it's open season on Jews. And Satan and the Antichrist are doing their very best to completely eliminate every Jew in the planet. planet. And so as uh, the uh, image of Antichrist is established in the temple, from that moment on, of course, then the Gentiles have complete run of the temple. And so <clears throat> we see these various representations of what there is in uh, Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 and Daniel 8, as we see these uh, kingdoms that are talked about that the Lord will deal with, because as we know, uh, we'll come back to that in a sec, as we know, those kingdoms uh, will be completely terminated by the rock, uh, and that stone uh, is the Lord Jesus Christ in his second coming. And so in Daniel 2, it says, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. So now we're at this place. Uh, at uh, uh, from in Babylon where it's now talking about the Lord is now talking about the kingdom that is coming and uh, so all that history that there has been up to this point it's now in God's timing to let us know that he is going to now move to establish the kingdom and you'll notice a number of things about this kingdom as we read through and we list them in just a moment. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. So no destruction. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. What does that mean? Well, uh, if you think in terms of the Babylonians, uh, and they uh, were defeated by Medo-Persia, and so Medo-Persia uh, Medo took over everything that the Babylonians had. Okay. But when Christ comes to establish his kingdom, uh, it'll never be left over to anybody because there'll never be the possibility of it being defeated. And uh, so it'll not be left to other people as, uh, as kingdoms like the Babylonish kingdom or the Medo-Persia kingdom or the Greek kingdom or the Roman kingdoms. Uh, they are all ended and defeated and somebody took over what they left behind. But that'll never happen with this kingdom that God will establish. It says, it shall break in pieces. This kingdom shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. 
So this re-emphasis on the eternality of this kingdom that's going to be created by God. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, which of course is the composite uh, metals, etc., of the uh, image, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. The dream is certain, and the interpretation is sure. And so uh, no mistaking about this. You better listen up because God has spoken. And so we have uh, this uh, prophecy that is given and uh, is explained uh, by Daniel uh, to Nebuchadnezzar. Sorry. Uh, and uh, as he does that, uh, he sets out for us uh, what God's plans are going to be. And so God is moving things forward. So some of the things, again, that have been mentioned in this one verse, Daniel 2, 44. God will establish his king and set up his kingdom. Now, take note of that. I want you to notice that God will establish the kingdom. That's what the verse says. And so the whole thing about kingdom now that is going on in our days is a falsehood. Uh, and those who would promote it and say that we have got to work to bring in the kingdom, uh, in other words, it's our efforts that will bring in the kingdom, uh, they are going directly against the word of God where it says God will do it all. He, and he really doesn't need our help. Does he? And so eventually when you see the Lord Jesus Christ actually come to the earth, uh, it is him that does it all. He comes as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He destroys the enemies that are there. And then he establishes his 1,000 year kingdom and uh, he does it all by himself. I know he's accompanied by us, the church, and by hosts of heaven, uh, but really it's by the word of his mouth, isn't it? And the sword of his mouth. And so we see this kingdom that is physical, that is real, it's touchable, and it's on the earth. Now that's important, because again, those who would come from a Calvinistic point of view or a Reformed theological point of view, they don't believe that. And uh, I have here an article that I took off, uh, I'm trying to remember uh, that Calvinistic website. There's a lot of good stuff on it, by the way, but uh, this is an article on that website, and the, uh, the writer is dealing with the kingdom of God, past, present, and future. And here's an idea of what they believe with regard to the present. The New Testament also proclaims that Jesus will return to reign as king, bringing justice, peace, delight, and victory. Well, that's true. We live then in the tension between the already and the not yet. The kingdom was established with Israel. Now notice he's talking past tense. Okay? The kingdom was established with Israel, inaugurated with Christ in his coming. So he's talking about the first advent. And achieved in the events of Christ's death and resurrection. Even though the kingdom effects have begun, their full results await Christ's return. So the Reformed theology uh, position would be uh, that the moment Christ died, and the moment people started to get saved, that's the kingdom. Okay? And so they spiritualize it. And uh, we'll talk, there is a sense, uh, we'll, well, we'll talk about that in a moment. But the idea is that in Christ being glorified in heaven and sitting on the Father's right hand, he is actually reigning and fulfilling the prophecies with regard to the kingdom. But when we go through, we will see, uh, or we will see that what we have already talked about in here, and uh, we're going to end up in Matthew, and 
I just thank Warren because he saved me a whole lot of time when we get there. Uh, but we'll, I'll refer you back to some of the things that Warren said and we'll look at some other things. Uh, and Warren made it very clear that Christ offered the kingdom, but it was rejected, right? So how could he be reigning over his kingdom if the kingdom was rejected? And Warren also made it clear that the type of kingdom that was expected, and this is what the Bible teaches, is that it was a physical, political kingdom. And so this concept of Reformed theology, I would suggest, is totally contrary to the Word of God. And so uh, their idea, and when you read, actually, if you read through this article, and if you read some of their other stuff, they kind of mix themselves all up. They're, they're trying so hard to make uh, people coming to know Christ today the kingdom of God. Now, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about what believers today are in relation to the kingdom. Okay? But we'll do that when we get to Matthew. So just to give you that little sort of preview of differences with regard to what we believe is to be true from the Bible and uh, what, uh, what the uh, Reformed theologians happen to believe. As we go on, let me just finish this slide. Uh, that is, God's kingdom will never be destroyed, as we saw. And once it's been established, there'll never be another king or kingdom. If it's eternal, you don't need another one. Okay? It'll never happen again. And God's kingdom will crush and put an end to all previous kingdoms. And, of course, it'll be eternal. Now, many people listen to uh, John MacArthur. And Mr. MacArthur has said and done a lot of good stuff. But I want to read you some things from John MacArthur's mouth. Uh, these are things he actually wrote or said. Uh, one it was an interview, I believe, questions and answers. And the other is from his book, The Gospel According to Jesus. First of all, The Gospel According to Jesus. Here's how he would regard what we teach there is a tendency, however, for dispensationalists to get carried away with compartmentalizing truth to the point that they make unbiblical differentiations. Now, one of the things that uh, we, uh, those in the, in the line in which we are have always taught is that there are things that differ and those are to be distinguished in the scriptures but they are not artificial divisions. They are not uh, us looking at something and making up uh, something that is artificial. They are real and they uh, separate Israel from the church, for instance. Uh, and again, uh, when you get to Reformed theology, there is no separation because for them, the church is the continuation uh, from the Old Testament. And so, and from Israel, and Israel, uh, God has finished dealing with Israel, okay? So, that's the first criticism. An almost obsessive desire to categorize and contrast related truths has carried various dispensationalist interpreters, and any less some, Schaefer, that would be Dallas Theological Seminary, in its beginning, uh, it's changed a lot now, but way back it's, uh, it was pretty solid. And Ryrie, and Ryrie is a key person when it comes to uh, various things, Hodges, etc. And uh, it's carried various dispensationalist interpreters far beyond the illegitimate distinctions between Israel and the church. So hear what he's saying. He's saying there are distinctions between Israel and the church. And... Uh, We'll explain his view in a minute when we read uh, what he said in an interview. Uh, many would also draw hard lines between the salvation and discipleship in brackets, justification and sanctification, and hard lines between the church and the kingdom, Christ preaching and the apostolic message. In other words, what he's saying there is, what Christ preached when uh, Warren went through last night 
and uh, said that Christ uh, preached the gospel of the kingdom and sent out his disciples to preach the gospel of the kingdom and told them not to go to anybody except to the nation of Israel. Uh, in, and so uh, John MacArthur is saying uh, that Christ's preaching in the gospel of the kingdom is exactly the same as the apostolic message, which is the gospel of grace. Okay, so no, no division between them. Okay? Faith and repentance and the age of law and the age of grace. Now here's uh, in his questions and answers where he's, uh, he was answering them on uh, recording. So this is him speaking uh, without forethought, uh, being asked a question. And he says, I was raised in a dispensational environment. There's no question. But as I got into seminary, I began to test some of those things. I have been perhaps aptly designated as a leaky dispensationalist. <laughs> That's his own made up term. Here's my dispensationalism. I'll give it to you in one sentence. There's a difference between the church and Israel, period. Now, he doesn't say what that difference is. He's already said in his book, uh, there doesn't seem to be much of a difference between them. Uh, so you take him at his word. Uh, and you can choose which word to take, the book or when he's answering in person. At the same time in seminary, I began to be exposed to reading among more reformed theologians. And over the years of exegeting the scripture, it has again yielded to me a reformed theology. I was convinced of it, that is reformed theology, when I started and I'm more convinced of it now as I've gone through the text. Now, listen carefully to the reason he holds to Reformed theology. I was convinced of it when I started because I read so many noble men who have held that view. Okay? So it's not because of the scriptures. It's because of the noble men who hold the view. And, but then he follows that up. He says, it was more at that point hero worship, and now it's become my own. So, again, if you listen to MacArthur, be very discerning in what you're listening to. Uh, there is much good that he says and has said, uh, but you need to be very careful because you know exactly where he's coming from. Okay? Pardon? A little left. A little leaven, yeah. You can think about this one. If we believe what we believe about salvation, etc., does Reformed theology fall into the category of what, it talk, what Paul talks about in Galatians, another gospel? Anyway, I'll leave that with you. You can think about that one. So <clears throat> we've seen the times of the Gentiles. Now, what's the purpose of the times of the Gentiles? It's about God judging Israel. Sorry, we're looking at the time. Are we out of time? 6.30, 50 minutes. I think we still got time. It's about God judging Israel uh, and Jerusalem by bringing it under the oppressive hand of Gentile government. That's what the time of, of the Gentiles is about. Now, why? Why is there the times of the Gentiles? Well, if we go back to Ezekiel chapter 16, uh, we will see the extent of Israel's sin and the reason God brings judgment. So Ezekiel 16 and verse 48. And it is, uh, he's talking about Israel and Judah, the two, uh, the two kingdoms. And they are being categorized as Sodom uh, and a sister. Uh, so, as I live, saith the Lord, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters, as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness was in her, and in her daughters, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor 
and the needy. And uh, in verse 51 it says, Neither hath Samaria committed half thy sins. So what he was talking about was Judah. And neither hath Samaria committed half thy sins. You hear what God's saying? Samaria got judged first because of her sin. But now that it's time to judge Judah, you guys are even worse than your sister, Samaria. Okay? In fact, uh, if we had read earlier where Assyria came in and uh, took away uh, the northern kingdom, we would have found that Samaria, uh, Assyria, sorry, uh, and uh, we would have found that Assyria also started to move against Jerusalem, in other words, Judah, but God held them back. And so uh, now it's time for Judah's uh, judgment. And in verse 51, neither has Samaria committed half of thy sins, but thou hast multiplied thine abominations more than they, and hast justified thy sisters in all thine abominations which thou hast done. So what's the picture? Well, we've got this picture of the nation uh, being uh, judged and disciplined. <laughs> And in the midst of that are these prophecies that are going to move God's plan forward. And we have the 490 years and the 483 of them that bring us to the advent of Messiah. Uh, 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 actually, towards the end of his, his ministry. And, uh, so, and God is now talking about kingdoms and destroying earthly kingdoms. Uh, kingdoms that are motivated by the enemy, by Satan and he's going to establish his kingdom. And so as we move forward and we come into uh, this time uh, when the Lord Jesus will come, we will see why he comes and does nothing else initially except preach the gospel of the kingdom. Because this is all in God's plan. As he moves forward, both to uh, provide salvation in the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, but also to deal with this matter of the kingdom that was stolen back in the Garden of Eden. Now, you have to make a difference between uh, the times of the Gentiles and the fullness of the Gentiles, and we'll deal with that and then stop here for questions, etc. So in Romans chapter 11, and so when you mention chapter 11, you should know that 9, 10, and 11 has to do with why God sets Israel aside for a time and the church comes in. And so in Romans 11, it says, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. And in the, uh, another translator by the name of Mounts, uh, he puts it this way, a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And uh, the old standard, W.E. Vine, in his dictionary, he says the completion, uh, that the fullness of the Gentiles is the completion of the number of Gentiles who receive blessing through the gospel. And so what it's talking about is this age in which we are in, this age of grace uh, in which the church exists, uh, God has a finish point for that. And of course, we know that that will be the rapture, but the rapture will not happen until the number of Gentiles who are going to be saved have been saved. And when that number is complete, then the rapture occurs. And so there's the times of the Gentiles, which is the time uh, from Nebuchadnezzar right until the end of the tribulation when the Gentiles dominate Israel and want to uh, control Israel. Uh, they initially spread the, the Jews all over the world. That was one way to control them. And now that Israel has become a country again, they do absolutely everything to interfere in Israel. Uh, think about the number of uh, decisions against Israel that have happened in the United Nations. If you actually go and count them, it's absolutely unprecedented. And nations that are literally slaughtering people, 
they have no decisions against them in the United Nations. But it doesn't matter. If Israel breathes, they have a decision against them in the United Nations. And the UN wants to control everything. So that is the times of the Gentiles, but the fullness of the Gentiles is those who will be saved in this age of grace. Of course, we don't know when that will happen. So our responsibility is not to worry about how many will be saved. It's uh, our responsibility to make sure they hear the gospel so that they can be saved. So, so let's stop there and we'll uh, uh, think of questions, if you have questions or comments.